Right then, here we are in what I've called the first chamber. And I said earlier on that this is a big souterrain. And I've read records that there are at least three other souterrains. Um, they're big. This is a big size. Normally, most souterrains in the Burren would be about a fifth of the size. They would normally be about three feet wide and about three feet high. So as you can see, this is big. This is where you can have a number of people live in bad weather. And that's important to bear in mind. Not all souterrains were used as refuges away from marauding people. So this is of a size which would easily accommodate a number of people. As I was saying, maybe something like a, a team watching the, uh, watching the coastline. Uh, and watching the coastline, as I was saying, for either uh, bandits, attackers, or even if the, the lord of the area was levying taxes. You know, if people are catching fish, if people are bringing import materials from abroad. I mean, we know that Catter Connell, uh, certainly in the 16th and 17th century, had extensive international trade with Germany because we found coins there. But to return to this souterrain, a couple of interesting points down here which are quite quirky. Number one, at the end, we have this niche. It's quite unusual really for a souterrain to have niches of this sort of size. They're not unknown. But whatever it was there for, who knows, it could have been there for maybe you no know, shell, something as simple as that. Uh, it doesn't go back very far, but it's a niche for some reason or other. But interestingly enough, there's another one at the far end. Not quite a mirror image, but uh, nonetheless, somebody went through a great deal of trouble to actually fit that. Now, from this position, if we actually return to the entrance, I want you to look at where we come in. Now looking back up through here, you can see that this was constructed as a door. And you can see the entrance actually came down and stepped over the opening into the second chamber, which is interesting in itself. So one way or another, there was some kind of door here that could shut out the weather, or even an attacker thing. So what we're going to do now, we'll wriggle through into the next chamber. And Okay, so we're in a situation now where we're looking back through the, uh, the entrance that we've just come through. And again, what's interesting is, is the size of this entrance. Now, there appears to be two significant rocks here which appear like door jams. So it's very possible that there could have been a door um, put up against there and blocked against attackers. Why I keep using the, for the term uh, attackers is because what we're in now, this section, is relatively easily defendable. So if you've got a number of people who are intent on raiding you, you can seal yourself up in here and hope that they don't stay around too long. You'd have water down here and you'd also have provisions because, you know, this is a chamber in similar size to what's um, into the first chamber. So even if determined attackers got through there, there's a final defensive place, which is just down here. What we have here is called a creep. This was constructed so is 
to make an escape. So if you were pursued, you could run in here, crawl down through there, and sit the other side with a, a weapon or other, and any intruder who's pursuing you, you could then kill as he crawled through this in an unprotected fashion. In this kind of constricted passage, there's no way an attacker could easily defend himself. You're coming through a small aperture where a well-aimed stone on the head... So, imagine I'm an intruder, and this is how I would ch be chasing the people who have taken refuge. So as you can see, even though I'm wearing a helmet, and they may have done, you're in a particularly vulnerable position for an attack. Which is why this particular type of defensive feature, known as a creep, was so popular in so many souterrains throughout Ireland. So we're now in the final, if you like, the third chamber, and it is surprisingly large. Looking at the, the soil in that, that you can see up the slope there, it looks as though it's washed in. It's an interesting, it's an interesting soil, and it's an interesting slope, but there is soil there, and it's not the glacial fill. You know, it's not the, the local glacial stuff. So this is all topsoil that's been washed in over the years. Um, up the top there, that isn't a large stone. That's kind of calcified, um, a calcified surface. So, you know, the, the, the calcium from out of the rock like this is actually settled on the clay surface. So, again, originally, I mean, from where we are now, this chamber would have been an extra 10 feet long. So, I, again, you could get... Probably, if it weren't a garrison manning this outpost, you could get them all in here if they were, if the ring fort defences upstairs were actually overpowered. So, there you are, Batty. I hope this is of use to you and of some uh, uh, useful information. Um, I think that's it. Thanks for your patience and thanks for your time. And certainly thanks for the permission for me to come down here and survey it. And... Uh, Yes. Thanks a million, Matt. Batty.